Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're just gonna wait for a couple more attendees and then we will get started. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Manal Foz, and today's webinar is called Gaining Financial Confidence for Muslim Women in Medicine. Women face unique financial challenges, and over the next hour or so, we're going to examine some of these challenges and discuss some practical ways for, for women to take control of their financial lives. At the end of the presentation, We'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. So if you do have questions, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. And I just wanna remind you before we get started that every individual situation is unique. So make sure that you consult with your advisor before implementing some of the strategies that we're going to be reviewing together. And one more housekeeping item before we get into this. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so registrants will receive a copy by email in the next few days. A little bit about Azad before we delve into our topic. Azad was founded in 1997, and today we manage a little over $1.5 billion for our clients who live all over the United States. We combine halal investment management with holistic financial planning which we'll talk more about in today's webinar. We like our clients to think of us as their personal CFOs, well-versed in Islamic financial principles. I'm happy to be joined by three of my colleagues, Reem Hussain, Fatma Iqbal, Deborah Klein. All three are certified financial planners at Azad. Together, they have a combined financial industry experience of over four decades. They've worked at large institutions and small boutique planning firms. Their strengths include working with individuals, families, business owners, and nonprofits across a full array of comprehensive financial planning areas, including retirement, tax planning, and estate planning. Reem has both her master's and her doctorate in financial planning. And Fatma has an economics degree from Cornell and her master's is from Rochester. She also has, brings a very unique perspective of the challenges women physicians face since her own mother was a physician before retiring. And Deborah Klein also has a degree in economics and ran her own business for several years. So that's a little bit about your speakers. And now I'll pass it on to Deborah. Thanks, Mel. Um, today we're going to be discussing the importance of planning, setting goals, and other important considerations that are unique and relevant to women. And as you can see, there's a lot to consider. The goal for this webinar is really for you to just take away a few good tips or a perspective that can help you as you think about your own finances. And please also know that Azad Asset Management is here to help you navigate the complexities of individual financial situations. Yes, Deb, I, I do agree with you. There is a lot to consider, and that's why we have grouped our conversation today into three sections. So we will start with planning with confidence. This is about how to plan where you want to go, then how to get started and build your wealth. And we will go over some tactics and strategies. And finally, we will talk about how we can control the controllables. So what happens if things and uh, things do not, and most certainly won't go as planned. We certainly have a lot to cover this evening. So let's start with planning with confidence. Fatma, uh, Deb, as you meet with your clients, how do you like to start the planning conversation? Fatma, if we can start with you. Sure. So thanks, Manel. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I would say that, you know, when I first meet with, with prospects, I usually like to ask, you know, what prompted you to reach out to us? 
what is it that's important to you? What made you pick up the phone and make this call? Because once we can understand what the pain point is for that prospect and what changes she wants to see, it really makes it easier for us to have a more impactful and meaningful conversation. And then we can also look for gaps. You know, we like to understand if they've had any previous experiences with an advisor. Was that a good experience? Was there something lacking? And also, you know, how important is it for them to align their finances with their Muslim faith? You know, are there other decision makers in their family or even how involved have they been in their finances in the past? So all of this opens up the conversation. So again, we can better understand what they're looking for. And then again, how we can be of help. Yes, Fatima, those are great points. And the question about what do you want your life to look like is one of my favorite parts of planning. I love hearing about client from clients about their dreams and aspirations. And over time, of course, those dreams can change. And, and that's fine. At first, it may be about paying for college. And later on, it may be caring for an aging parent or spouse. Uh, the key is keep coming back to see if your plan is keeping up with your vision. What do you have to do and what additional pieces can you do to reach those goals? So I'm going to let Fatima share some more thoughts on this. Sure. So, so thanks, Deb. So, you know, many of us may be familiar with this hadith. It's very famous about tie your camel first and then put your trust in Allah. And this is going back to a story about a Bedouin man who left his camel without tying it. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked the man, why didn't you tie your camel? And the man replied, because I put my trust in Allah. And we all know kind of the, the, how the story goes. The prophet then told the man that he needs to tie his camel first and then put his trust in Allah. So we often talk about this hadith being relevant in so many areas of our life, but it really is important, especially when it comes to our finances. And, you know, we know that our risk ultimately comes from Allah, but we also have that responsibility for planning. And, you know, we know it can be overwhelming. It can, it can feel daunting, but really we can start with some simple steps. And the first step that I would say is first, just to make a list of everything you own. So it might be your bank accounts, your real estate. Uh, maybe you have a 401k at work or old IRAs. Maybe you've opened up accounts for your children. Um, sometimes women might have assets internationally or inheritance that they've received. So really it's just about getting all of those fears, anxieties, and then translating them to goals. So Reem, I know you also work with a lot of women in this kind of planning. You know, what are some things that you usually advise women when they're just starting out with their plan? So I also encourage women to write out their goals. So what are the key expenses they want to plan for? Is it for retirement, children's education, gift to charity, or hedge? So first, it's good to make a quick inventory of your goals. Once you have an idea what you want your plan to accomplish, we help clients delve deeper into those goals. So for example, um, how do you envision your retirement and at what age you would like to achieve your financial independence so you no longer need to work for money? And uh, do you want to travel or give gift to family member or to charity? And do you want to work um, as a part-time or volunteer your time? So all these discussions can help us understand what is important to them. And after going through this exercise with clients, usually they have one of these initial thoughts, either, hey, I'm in excellent shape. I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. Or, okay, I, I seem to be doing all right, but am I missing anything? What else can I adjust? Or, I might be a bit behind. What can I do to get back on track or even to get on track? So regardless of how you feel, it's never too late to start planning. We can sit down with you and help you tweak your plan to achieve your long-term goals. And that's the benefit of working with an advisor. Yeah, thanks so much, Deb. So, you know, having an understanding of your assets and goals, again, are going to be so important. And, you know, believe it or not, it's actually surprisingly not hard to lose track of even what you do have. So I have a client who called me and forgot that she had about $30,000 in an old 401k account from her first job. You know, she had no idea where it was. She hadn't seen a statement in a long time or how it was invested. So that's definitely a missed opportunity uh, when that account could really be helping her towards reaching her goals. So when we like to define goals, we like to define goals that are SMART. And you might have heard of this acronym before, but SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Timely. 
And again, not all these goals might have the same priority in your life. So for example, there may be some goals that are absolute needs, right? And we have to make sure that we do everything possible for you to reach those goals. But there may be other goals that you have that are wants or wishes. And again, we could adjust those based on your financial constraints. All of this planning that is done is again to give you that peace of mind and it just helps you increase your confidence in your particular situation. You know, of course, we can't know what every situation or hurdle uh, out there is going to be, but we can use financial modeling and technology to really just better understand your plan and how successful it can be. So for example, if I told you there's a 90% probability of success that your plan will meet your goals, you would probably have a lot more confidence in your plan than if I were to say it's 50 or 60%, right? So Reem, you know, I know you also have a doctorate in financial planning, but could you kind of explain to us how we could implement some of these ideas into an actual plan? Yeah, sure. So we focus on goal-based planning and we use financial software that can help us answer questions ranging from general to very specific. For example, some clients just want to get an idea of, uh, do I have enough money for retirement? And other times we may be helping client understand how certain scenario may impact their planning. So many times we have clients who have a plan and then come back to us saying, what if I need long-term care or should I buy a vacation home? So we can run multiple scenarios to, the, to give them context on how things may play out using different assumptions. And this has really helped to give um, someone actionable steps to take. Wow, that's really good. So after we've identified our goals, what comes next? Uh, Reem, can you talk to us more about some of the strategies and tactics to get us towards achieving those goals that we've identified? And you mentioned the words financial planning. What does that even mean? Yeah. So there are a lot of different understanding of what financial planning or wealth management is. So some may think it's just about having enough money or lots of money, but really financial planning means taking holistic look at these different components that, that all have an impact on your financial life. So uh, some of these things that you see on the screen, you may already be doing and other you may need uh, to focus more time on it or hire a professional. But um, regardless, I want to commend you all for taking the time to join webinar like this. So you are really taking the first step to make sure that you are on the right track. And uh, with this being a female focused uh, webinar, I don't want to highlight that we know everybody's different. We all different, not the same, but we do see some differences in financial planning for men versus women. So, uh, um, let me ask you a question. Do you approach plans different when you, um, you're you working with a woman as opposed to a man? Yes, I do. I sometimes do approach them differently in that, in general, women tend to put others first. For example, women usually ask about college planning for their kids before asking about retirement for themselves. I also realize that women attending this webinar have a lot on their plate. You guys are taking care of patients while juggling demanding jobs and family schedules. This often leads to other things taking priority over finances. Sometimes women feel like they have enough responsibilities without adding finances to that list. Sometimes with married couples, we find one spouse, usually the husband, may be the one overseeing the finances. Or single women may have given that responsibility to someone else like a father or a brother. Um, Another thing that makes planning for women differently is their longevity. Women do tend to live longer than men, so the money needs to last longer. And women also tend to be more generous with their money during their lifetime in terms of gifting to family and charities, and that may be taking the place of saving for themselves. Being more risk averse is another factor. The investment portfolios that, we that they have may be more conservative because they are trying to protect the assets that they do have. So while these priorities are well-intentioned, they, well they can create challenges. And that's why it's so important to start the planning process early. Invest in yourself and review your plan regularly to make sure that you're staying on track. That's good advice, Deb. You hit on some really great points and realities that many of us face. It further emphasizes the fact that you really do have to be the champion of your own financial success. 
nobody's going to do it for you, right? But again, for a lot of us, there's a lot going on in our lives. We have a lot of sometimes like opposing goals and priorities. And it's important to remember that there's no one size fits all. Financial planning is an ongoing process that follows us pretty much from early childhood to old age. In fact, life cycle financial planning can be separated into five stages. Your teenage years, young adulthood, starting a family, planning to retire, and successful retirement. And depending on where you are in the life cycle, there can be specific planning te techniques and focus areas that can make a significant difference in your financial health. But regardless of where you are, it's really important to adopt some good financial habits. But sometimes, like I said, it can still feel pretty overwhelming. There's just so much to consider. I see on here, for example, it's listing family conversations. Are you saying, Deb, that I should be talking to my husband about my credit card purchases? Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, Manal. When it comes to family conversations, the key is communication. Open dialogue is essential so that both of you are aware of each other's spending and saving habits. Working together and doing things like coordinating 401k contributions is also vital. If one spouse is not working, it doesn't mean they can't contribute to an IRA if the other spouse is. Coordinating planning between spouses like utilizing a spousal IRA can be a great strategy. These discussions not only strengthen your financial partnership, but also help uh, balance differing styles. Maybe one partner is more conservative while the other tends to spend more. It's important to talk about it and find common ground. It's also important to have these con candid discussions about financial responsibilities sooner rather than later. Additionally, uh, one of the things we'd like to do at Azad is we'd like to see couples attend at least a few advisory meetings together, especially the initial ones, so that we can foster a better understanding collaboration, and just try to get everyone on the same page, or at least in the same book. Even con another conversation is determining when and how to share financial information with your children. Even young kids can learn about money management. If they receive an allowance, teach them to allocate portions for charity, spending, and saving. Making it a game at a young age can instill some good habits. We also recognize that single individuals or those in new relationships face unique challenges, particularly regarding financial titling and planning. For singles, finding a trusted advisor can provide valuable support and feedback and help keep you on track. Lastly, I wanna emphasize the importance of self-care, particularly for women who put themselves last. We all know that burnout is a real factor to think about. And so getting finances in order early may help you may help you ease up a bit later in your career or possibly retire earlier than you thought you could. With that in mind, Reem, can you discuss uh, how to plan for longer retirement? Yeah, sure. Let's uh, chat a little bit about retirement planning. So this discussion can cover the wide range of topics. So We'll start with the essentials of retirement saving accounts. So for those still working, it's crucial to contribute to your employer's retirement plan. And a common question is how much to save? And actually the answer varies based on the individual circumstances. However, what we recommend that at minimum, you should contribute enough to get the full employer match. And ideally for saving, aim for contribution rate between 10 to 20 percent. I see. And uh, Reem, what about when you change jobs? What options do you have with your 401k? What can you do? Yeah. So if you find yourself changing jobs, it is important to know your options for your old retirement plan. So when you leave your job, you will be entitled to the distribution of your vested balance. And generally, you have three options. Either you leave your money in the former uh, employer's plan, or you, or you can roll it over to an IRA or transfer it to uh, your new employer 401k if allowed. And the decision like choosing between whether to roll it over to a new 401k, uh, the empl new employer's 401k or to an IRA depends on your needs. So IRAs typically offer more investment options 
and including halal investments and greater flexibility for distributions, uh, while the 401k may provide better uh, creditor protection. I see. So a lot of us understand the importance of building our 401k for retirement and the tax benefits that uh, it offers. But then when we transition from a steady paycheck to relying on our retirement savings, that can be pretty nerve wracking. I mean, who wants to see their retirement balance going down, right? Psychologically, it's just, it's difficult. So Reem, how can strategic planning help after we retire? Yeah, so actually for those already retired, it's very important to strategize where to withdraw funds from, whether from the retirement accounts, non-retirement accounts, or the tax-free Roth accounts. So as you said, careful planning is necessary to avoid unintentionally pushing yourself into a higher tax bracket, especially when factoring an income stream like social security. So running various scenarios can help clarify your uh, options. I see. And uh, there's another option, actually. What about uh, health savings accounts? How can these fit into one's planning? Yeah, actually, um, many may not realize that health saving account can act like additional retirement account. So health saving accounts allow you to save tax-free if you have a high deductible health plan. So instead of using the HSA funds immediately for medical expenses, consider saving them for retirement. So HSAs have triple tax advantages. Contributions are pre-tax, the accounts grow tax deferred, and the withdrawals for qualified medical expenses are tax-free. I see. Thank you so much, Reem. Many women, after securing their own retirement savings, will then shift focus, like Deb mentioned earlier, to saving for their children's education. However, it's crucial to remember that while there are financial aid options for education, there's no such safety net for retirement. I mean, even Social Security isn't a complete solution. Women often express guilt over not saving enough for their children's education. But it's important to recognize that inadequate retirement savings could lead to becoming financially dependent and even a burden on your kids later in life. So with that said, Deb, assuming a woman does have her retirement savings on track, what strategies would you recommend for saving for a child's education? And where should she start with education planning? Oh, thanks, Mel. Well, yeah, the first start is to plan for how much do you think it's going to cost? Start by estimating the total cost, which should include tuition, room and board, books, and other fees. And also, are you planning for your child to attend a public or a private university? Are you just planning undergraduate or graduate school also? It's important to also account for an inflation rate of about 5 to 6% per year for future costs. So while some colleges do offer merit-based scholarships, most financial aid packages consist of loans, so it's better not to plan on them. Educational savings options include 529 plans, Coverdell educational savings accounts, and Uniform Transfers to Minors Act, UTMA, call them UTMA accounts, and each has its unique features. 529 plans offer tax benefits for education-related expenses, but they are often limited to specific mutual funds which may not align with Islamic principles. In contrast, Coverdell's and UTMA accounts provide a wider range of investment options, including mutual funds and individual stocks. A Coverdell ESA is a tax-advantaged account specifically for educational expenses. It's allowing for free, tax-free growth and withdrawals for qualified costs. However, contributions are not tax deductible and the maximum annual contribution is currently $2,000 per child. And there are some income limits. UTMA accounts are managed by the adult custodian, an adult custodian until the minor reaches the age of majority, which is generally 18 to 21, depending on which state you live in. And these can be used for any expense that benefits the minor, including education. Again, contributions for this account are not tax deductible, but any capital gains are taxed at the minor's lower rate. And one thing to keep in mind with UTMA accounts is that the account ownership is transferred to the child at the age of majority. 
So the child may or may not choose to spend those funds on college. So you really want to make sure you know your child. Yeah, you sure do. There's a lot of parents who have up my regret. So after saving for education, women often want to plan uh, their charitable giving, specifically for Zakat. Uh, Reem, can you talk to us about Zakat planning or charitable giving? Yeah, sure. So as the Muslim, um, we all know that the Zakat is a big part of our charitable giving and mandatory for every living Muslim who meets certain assets conditions. So regardless of their gender, age, or mental status. Um, however, this topic could fill an entire seminar. We will keep it high level and just focus on particular strategies. I see. So how do you recommend that your client plan for their zakat? I understand that they have to pay zakat based on a percentage of their assets, but how can they do this in a more tax efficient manner? Yeah, so many like people are paying their zakat through like cash or uh, writing a check, but interestingly that writing a check may not be the most tax advantage approach to give to charity. So uh, for for those who have like a taxable investment account, one effective strategy is gifting a stock you held for more than one year. So um, th this way it can allow the donor to claim tax deduction for the full market value of the gift while avoiding uh, paying like, the, the capital gains taxes on the appreciated value. So to illustrate this better with an example, so suppose that you bought a stock for $5,000 a few years ago, and now it's worth $10,000. So if you donate the stock directly to the charity, you can deduct the full $10,000 without paying capital gain taxes on the $5,000 appreciation. And what about uh, donor advised funds? We have a lot of our clients who have gaps to align their giving with their tax planning. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how those work, Reem? Yeah. So the donor advised fund um, is a charitable fund that allows you to accumulate charitable dollars for giving in the future. So when you put money or shares in the donor advice fund, you get an upfront tax deduction the year you make the contribution. For example, um, you may have already completed all your charitable giving for the year, but you realize that you could save in taxes by having a higher charitable uh, deduction. So when you put funds into the donor advice fund, you claim the deduction this year. So remember that you you claim the deduction in the year you make the contribution, but you can give to charities um, at any time in the future. So for example, you can give it next year or five years, or even when you are retired and need to pay as a cow on assets that you have accumulated, but you no longer have the same cash flow. And another um, advantage that I would like to mention about the donor advice fund is that it can be passed on to your children. So it um, that will help to instill like charitable values in the next generation. Oh, wow, that sounds very powerful. Um, you mentioned that DAFs can be used to pay Zakat at any time, even during uh, retirement. Are there any other strategies that uh, our attendees should be aware of? Yes, actually, there are many more. So um, like we have like charitable trusts and foundation established as well, which can be used. But um, there is also a qualified charitable distribution, which is, which is a technique that those who are 70 and a half or who must take a required, uh, required minimum distribution after a certain age from their retirement accounts, uh, and by directing these distribution to a qualified charity, you can avoid taxes on the distribution while still contributing to a good cause. So all of these uh, strategies actually enhance your tax efficiency while maximizing your impact. Wow, that's right. And uh, perhaps because of our faith's emphasis on charitable giving, it's not hard to see why many of our physician clients are attracted to these strategies and accounts. However, there's another crucial aspect of financial planning that often gets overlooked, and that's estate planning. Uh, Fatima, could you share your insights on the importance of estate planning and what it entails? 
Sure. So the purpose of estate planning is really to preserve the assets you know that you've spent a lifetime building, protect your loved ones, and ensure that your wealth is distributed according to your wishes. And now, because you know we're also Muslim, we want to make sure it's done in accordance with our Islamic principles. So additionally, you know, it can help you manage potential estate taxes that could arise after your death. And there are some important documents that everyone really should have. And it's important that you discuss these with your estate planning attorney, but I'll go through them briefly. So first of all is a will. So everyone should have a will that you know, if you have minor children, it's going to appoint guardians for them. And it's also going to specify how your assets should be divided. Now, without a will, and some of us may have heard of circumstances where someone passed away suddenly, they didn't have a will. In that case, their wishes don't matter because any individually owned asset without a beneficiary is going to be distributed according to your state's intestacy laws. And again, those may not be what you wanted and they more than likely are not going to align with Islamic inheritance guidelines. The second one that is also important to, to consider is called a living trust. Now, this is a tool that can help your family avoid probate after you pass away, which is a process, you know, a court process. It can also help uh, your family maintain more privacy of your estate. And also it's used to, again, de designate how your assets should be distributed upon your death. I did see a question come in about trusts for children. And you can incorporate trusts for children within a living trust. So again, let's say you have minor children and you wanna put in more specifics about how those children should be, how the, fine, how the money should be used to care for those children or it should only be used for certain purposes like education, health, maintenance, support. All of those things you know, to, to, to protect your children can be added within a living trust. And there's also separate trusts that could be done uh, as well. Um, the third document, uh, again, as healthcare professionals, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, but that's the healthcare power of attorney. This is a document that will allow you to appoint someone to make healthcare decisions for you if you're unable to do so. I'd also remind you that if you have adult children, it's important they have a healthcare power of attorney in case you know you as a parent needs to make a healthcare decision for them. And also there's a financial power of attorney, and this is where someone is designated to handle your financial affairs if you become incapacitated. Now, if you have joint accounts, you wanna make sure that you understand who that designated person is that is going to get you know access to the assets after your death and to review any of those co-ownership provisions and account titlings. And then there's beneficiary designation. So certain assets like your IRAs, or if you have life insurance, those pass directly to your designated beneficiaries. So regularly reviewing those to make sure that they align with your overall estate plan is going to be crucial. Now, if you have a large estate uh, or you have family members with special needs or children with special circumstances, in that case, you may need to consider additional planning strategies. Those might be trusts or other, other tools that can again help you minimize those estate taxes and again protect your assets. And you know another concern specific to physicians, I would say often is asset protection planning. You know, right? So what happens uh, if you encounter a medical malpractice, mal medical malpractice lawsuit, or other kinds of creditors? So you know that kind of planning can be done again to protect your assets during your lifetime, and that's that's asset protection planning. Now. I know a lot of people have assumptions about how things might go uh, you know, after they're gone, but you know, that can also be misleading. So I once worked with a client, she had three children and she wanted to name her eldest child as a sole beneficiary. And when we talked about this, she explained that you know, she really viewed the eldest child, the eldest son as the most responsible. So she expected him to distribute the inheritance according to the Islamic inheritance guidelines. And you know, her intention was really good, but again, this could lead to misunderstandings among her children after her passing, especially if they hadn't discussed it as a family and if the details weren't included in the estate planning documents themselves. The other two kids, you know, they might feel excluded at that point. And again, that could create tension with the family, which she didn't want. And another thing that she wasn't thinking about is that if the eldest child faced financial difficulties, let's say, you know, a divorce or a bankruptcy, then the entire inheritance for all her children could be at risk. So even with the best intentions, the legal implication can lead to, again, unintended consequences. So again, it's really important just to reassess your plans. If you don't have one, get one in place and at least annually review it or, or again, whenever there's some significant changes that happen. Wow, well, thank you. Uh, that's a lot to, uh, 
to consider. Uh, thank you so much for sharing those valuable insights. I did want to mention that Zed will be co-hosting a webinar on uh, Islamic estate planning uh, this December 20th with our friends at Sharia Wiz. So uh, I really encourage our audience to stay tuned for more information on that webinar. All right, so one area that we haven't yet covered is investment management. And uh, when we were actually preparing for this webinar, we came across several surveys, including one from Fidelity, that found that women actually outperform men in investment returns by 0.4%. That might not sound like much, but when it's compounded over many years can be very meaningful. For example, uh, someone who invested a million dollars, let's say, right, uh, for 25 years, and they earned 7.4, there's your 0.4%, would earn over half a million, $530,000 more than an investor who just netted returns of only 7%. So, you know, women tend to outperform men. That's may surprise you. And they are also more likely to remain calm and not make any big moves when the markets are shaky. They also tend to shy away from the newest and shiniest and riskiest investments. But with all that said, we still don't see ourselves as investors. In fact, that same survey that I just spoke about, it found that only 33% of us feel confident in our ability to make investment decisions. And even less than that, feel confident when it comes to long-term planning, like the planning we've been discussing today. So Fatima, help us understand what are some of the basic things that every woman should know about investing? Sure. So, you know, first of all, when we're talking about investing, we're talking about tradable securities like stocks and fixed income. So stocks, they're simply representing ownership in a company, while conventional fixed income like bonds, they involve lending money are debt obligations. So as you probably guessed, conventional bonds are not Sharia compliant because they deal in riba, but there are halal fixed income alternatives, again, that you should be aware of. But instead of buying individual stocks or halal fixed income, the other thing that you can do is you can also buy mutual funds. And mutual funds are a pool of investments typically banished by professionals. And we have an entire presentation you can find on our website at azadasset.com on halal investing. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all the details tonight, but I do encourage you to watch that to educate yourself. You know, it's very easy to invest in haram without knowing how to identify riba and the rules for halal investing. So another important consideration, you know, even if you are investing halal, is that you also have to do something called purification, which is different from zakah. So even when you're investing in halal portfolios, there may be some insignificant revenue, which was never intended and to benefit from, but that amount has to be, has to be uh, purified. Um, and again, that's an amount that needs to be uh, tracked and calculated and donated to charity. Uh, and that amount is actually neither zakah nor sadaqa, um, and it's money you just never intended to benefit from. But you know, again, just investing in a halal investment is a great first step, but it also has to, you also have to take care of the purification. Um, now, for those that are interested in halal investments, you know, we at Azad uh, have uh, Sharia compliant solutions. Uh, we adhere to strict halal guidelines. You know, we screen public market stocks to exclude those companies that are involved in things like alcohol, tobacco, gambling, weapons. Um, I would say Sharia compliance is really an active process. It's not just a label. So that means that really we have to regularly monitor these investments to ensure that they all remain within the ethical parameters. And I saw a question come up also about how are we different from you know, other uh, firms that are out there. Uh, you know, again, I would invite you to explore our website, but you know, definitely you know, we really uh, you know, take a lot of care in making sure that again, all of our investment products have uh, those that strict compliance. But in addition to that, you know, that's just the basis. The investments are just the starting part it's really important to have this financial picture in this, in this comprehensive level of planning. So that's what we do in addition, the services um, that we offer and help our clients really get to the goals that they're looking for. Um, I'll also add, there's another question about 401ks because again, 401ks are the area where a lot of women are investing. So the investments that your 401k plan offers may not be halal. Um, and you definitely should ask your employer if they offer what's called a self-directed brokerage account. That will allow you to invest in halal mutual funds 
or hire someone to help you with that. So uh, again, I would say that's something else to, to think about for investing. And when it comes to uh, concerns about investing, I think a lot of women, again, express concerns about investment risk. So that's essential to consider, um, you know, especially whenever you're aiming to achieve particular goals. When you develop a plan that aligns with your risk tolerance, that can be you know, really important. It's important to be realist, realistic about your investment expectations. Uh, and when assessing your investment risk, also consider key factors. Uh, for example, your time horizon, which is how long you need until you will access the funds. Also, the risk capital, or how much can you afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial well-being. It's also important to really understand investing um, because you know your understanding of investing can influence your risk tolerance. And making sure that you also have an you know a, an idea of your personal comfort level because your feelings about risk are going to be important as well. Now, age is going to play a critical role in, in determining your risk profile because the longer your investment horizon, the more aggressive you can afford to be. And diversification is another key area to managing the risk in your portfolio. Now, diversification means investing in different types of investments like stocks or halal fixed income spread out over different industries, different sectors, geographies, and company sizes. And all of this diversification can ultimately try to help you reduce fluctuations or volatility in your portfolio. So it doesn't guarantee profits or protect against losses, but diversification can help you manage that risk since different investments may not move in the same direction at the same time. Now, I would say that it's essential for women to recognize also that they can face lower retirement plan balances and social security benefits, especially if maybe they took time out of the workforce to care for their families. So the most effective step women can take is to start saving and investing as soon as possible. And here we have a table that illustrates how $2,000, $5,000, and $10,000 invested annually can grow over time at a 6% rate of return. So the ideal time would be to you know, start saving in your 20s. But if you haven't been able to do that, then you know, even starting in your 30s or 40s or even later can still help yield significant benefits. Um, as Manel mentioned, you know, my mother is a physician. She was in private practice for almost 40 years. And, you know, I saw her prom primary motivation was to always take care of her patients, you know, her staff, her family. And, you know, looking back, I now understand, you know, really how thin her time was stretched. But she did set up a retirement plan for her practice, and she contributed to it on an ongoing basis. So having that recurring contribution really helped her build that comfortable retirement, alhamdulillah, without having to give it a lot of thought. So setting up a recurring deposit in your investment accounts, again, can help you plan for your future without too much distraction or you know, really feeling that financial pinch. So again, I would say the key takeaway is that the earlier you can start saving, the better your financial future can be. Definitely. So you've identified your goals. Uh, you've started putting in place various strategies that we've talked about to achieve them. What's next, Deb? So the question on the slide is, are you prepared for the unexpected? I always tell my clients, the number one thing we know about planning is that plans will change. You may have been doing all the things we've been talking about, but what happens if your marital ch status changes or you lose your job? 94% of women believe they will be personally responsible for their finances at some point, but only 48%, less than half, are confident in their finances, which is why we're doing this webinar. We'd like to help build your confidence so you being closer to the 94% than the 48%. In helping Muslim women with financial planning, I've worked with clients in so many situations, women divorcing after long marriages, women who are single and caring for elderly parents, women who took time out of the workforce and need to go back, and also women who are suddenly widowed and thrust into making the financial decisions for their family. Why am I even bringing this up? I'm bringing it up because as women, we owe it to ourselves, not only to survive, but to thrive, right? So how do you do that? It's so important to have a support system built around you before these things happen. They can help you take, you know, you want to know that someone is watching those details so that you can just go and take care of all the other things that need to get done. We build a financial plan so that when something unexpected happens, we can go back to that plan and adjust it. We would have already done the heavy work and can quickly understand what changes need to be made. One of our jobs as planners and advisors 
is to be empathetic and also be the voice of reason, giving you unemotional advice when emotions can cause you to make some poor decisions. So whether it's a relationship change, the loss of a loved one, a health scare, or something else, having a team of professionals can be important to give you that peace of mind. Yeah, with that being said, uh, we understand it's always unimaginable to go through these uh, circumstances. But as you said, our job as advisor is to try to ease the burden as much as possible. Um, although it may be uncomfortable, but we need to address those what if scenarios before they happen. So, for example, what if you or your family member have a health concern and need additional care? Would you be in a position to take time off or have the ability to pay for the additional care? Um, are you uh, are your assets structured in a way that would be protected from creditor in the event of medical malpractice lawsuit? And what else I want to add is that not everything unexpected may be bad. So you can also plan for unexpected goodness to happen as well. So what if you come across a great opportunity to build and to build an orphanage 10 years in the future? Would you be um, have the ability to make a generous gift to make that happen? Yeah, and I would just add, you know, just like we can't control the weather or the stock market, we also can't control relationship changes, health issues, family changes, but we really can bring an umbrella for when the thunderstorm rolls in. And that's why being prepared means to know that you have a, you have in place a plan and you can get on track with any missing items. So if you have all your documentation ready, like your accounts, your statements, your estate planning documents, you know, it can be very quick to refer to them whenever you need. And if you have your emergency fund ready, you also won't need to figure out where to pull money you know, if the roof starts leaking. And again, with the right team in place, you'll also know who you need to call in order to help you through those difficult times. So we've covered a lot this evening. Uh, Fatima, any last minute thoughts? Sure. So again, I know that this topic is overwhelming. And again, we really appreciate you taking the time away from your busy lives. Um, but again, you're not alone in this journey. We know we've shared a lot of information and there is no real way for you to know everything. So again, making sure you have a team in place that listens to you and allows you to be the boss of your own finances is going to be very, very important. It absolutely is. Let's take a few questions uh, from our audience. Here is the first one. Uh, it's actually a very common one that we hear. My husband and I are always fighting about our finances. He is a risk taker and has lost us a lot of money, especially in crypto. I'm risk averse and I just want to stay in cash. It causes us both a lot of stress. Do you see this with your clients and can you help get us on the same page? Let's see, Deb, can you take this one? Yeah, it sounds like a financial com compatibility problem. We do okay. sometimes see this with couples who we work with. Differences over finances in your money script and your philosophy with managing your investments can cause a lot of friction in a relationship. Fighting about money is one of the top reasons couples split up. So if you're frequently arguing about money with your partner, seeing a therapist can be a good idea as it can help you understand the underlying issues behind the financial conflicts and develop healthier communication strategies to resolve them. There are also some questions you can ask even before getting married to try to glean financial compatibility, such as, are you a spender or a saver? How do you spend discretionary money? What would you do with extra cash? And remember, too, that marriage is a partnership. So you want to talk about who is going to handle the various aspects of your financial life, or are you going to do it together? You want to talk about your goals and what you need to do to get there. Talk about what kind of retirement you envision for yourself. What purchases should you save for in the next few years? You want to talk about your hopes and dreams. That's yeah, I mean, one thing one thing I just add also is that, again, it's important, I think, to talk about your financial philosophy, um, because, again, for some Muslims, halal investing or, again, abiding by the Islamic fin uh, financial principles, you know, it, it's, it's going to be really important for them. So you just want to make sure your spouse is on the same page with you when it comes, again, to riba and, and investing halal. That's really good advice. Very good. Uh, let's see here. This next question is from somebody who's asking about Social Security. We didn't talk too much about that. Um, she says that she's had to interrupt her career to take care of her kids. 
when all is said and done, she hasn't really accumulated as much in Social Security benefits like her husband, but she's wondering why that should matter. Um, won't she still benefit from her husband's Social Security benefit? Uh, Reem, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Actually, it's um, it's a common misconception that relying only on spouses' Social Security benefit is a sound strategy or a good strategy. So things you need to consider, like if you have your own work history, your your benefit may be higher than the spousal benefit. So the, your individual benefit may be higher than the spousal benefit. Another thing is the uh, survivor benefit. So if your spouse passes away, you can receive survivor benefit. But again, this will be the higher of your benefit or your spouse's. Um, also, Deb mentioned in the presentation about longevity and women uh, generally live more than men. So um, a robust financial plan is essential for potentially many years uh, in retirement. And also the financial independence, like building your own retirement saving will provide you more flexibility and security, and you can make independent choices for your future to and then to summarize all of that, they, while you can benefit actually from the spouse's social security, but it's crucial to consider your own contributions and plan for um, a secure financial future. That's really good advice, Reem. And um, let's see here, Fatma, this next one's for you, kind of related to the Q&A that you had earlier. Um, this person wants to know what is the difference between a financial advisor, investment advisor, registered representative, financial planner, broker. There's just so many titles out there. And she wants to know what is the difference and what questions should she ask before she hires someone to help her with her finances? All right. So I'll keep this simple. I think, you know, really the number one question that you need to ask is whether they are a fiduciary. Um, so certain licenses and designations like investment advisors holding a Series 65 license or a certified financial planning practitioner require that, uh, require that practitioner to actually act as a fiduciary for their clients. And that means that, again, they're required to act in the best interest of their clients and disclose any conflicts of interest. Now, on the other hand, someone who is a broker or who has a very generic title they may not carry that fiduciary responsibility. So again, it's important to understand if they have conflicts of interest and even how they're paid. You know, do they make commission on certain sales um, of products or do they have certain hidden fees? And, and finally, really understanding what services they offer. You know, what are they, what is it that you need and what is it that they provide? Um, and you can also ask for a referral, you know, to speak to an existing client to get a better understanding of their experience and how they've helped them to do. Absolutely. Uh, so this next question is also one that we hear a lot. Uh, she says, I'm a physician and so is my husband. Uh, combined, we make about a million dollars in income. We have a big house, cars, our kids are in private school, yet we don't feel rich. We feel like everything we make, we spend. How can we get a grip on our finances? What advice do you have for us? Deb, would you, what would you say to this couple? Well, I would say, you know, you want to first start with making a budget. I know nobody, you know, likes to do that, but you want to get an idea of all the essentials, mortgage, groceries, utilities. And I would be sure to include the savings in that budget, your retirement savings and, and emergency fund savings. I would also include a set amount each month for some fun stuff. You want to be able to go out to dinner, go to movies, that kind of thing. Then actually track your spending so that you can see where you're over, maybe overspending. There's a lot of apps that can help you with this. And also identify what triggers your impulsive spending. I've heard that uh, social media can kind of sometimes trigger that, that you, you, know, you, you need that and you don't really. Um, so you might want to limit social media. And also make a list. I'd make a list of uh, your planned purchases, like you know you need a new car next year. Make a list and stick to it, all right, so that you don't just are impulsively buying things as you walk through a store. True, true. Uh, Fatma, what advice would you give this family? So, you know, it's not an easy conversation, um, and I know a lot of us don't like to talk about money, but I do think it's important to have a conversation about what wealth means to them. So, 
you know, if we're honest, lifestyle creep is real, you know, as is, you know, keeping up with the Joneses or call it the Khans or the Ahmeds. But, you know, I, like I had a conversation with a good friend of mine who's a physician and, you know, she was feeling self-conscious after some friends commented that, you know, she, they thought that she would have had a more expensive designer handbag because, you know, she's a physician. So, you know, she confided you know, in me that even though she technically could afford it, you know, it just wasn't something that was going to bring her more happiness. And, you know, for her personally that, you know, she would rather give that money to someone who might need it. So, you know, I don't mean to imply again that we're, we shouldn't enjoy our wealth and we shouldn't spend on ourselves and our families, but we also have to remember that mo money has an opportunity cost. So for everything we do buy, there's something that we are not buying. And so if your cash flow is being consumed by your lifestyle, then you really need to ask yourself, okay, what is it that you're sacrificing? Are you sacrificing more choices for yourself and your family? Those choices might be like the option to retire earlier or to pay for more education for your kids or you know, to give more. So one very simple habit that I've seen successful physicians have is that whenever their income goes up, you know, like after residency or if they take a new job or they become a partner, they actually start increasing their savings and their giving more than they increase their spending. So, you know, again, I would say even in financial planning, we can look towards prophetic wisdom, really, that teaches us to stay in moderation. Yeah, that's good advice. But I know someone who we don't want to touch our money, and that is Uncle Sam. So somewhat related to the previous question, another attendee asks, what can we do to save on taxes? And it feels like Uncle Sam is just keeps trying to get a big chunk of it. Um, I've asked my accountant so many times, and he just doesn't seem to know how to help me. Can you tackle that, Fatima? Well, you know, as planners, um, we actually ask our clients to send us a copy of their completed tax return. So for us, the tax return is, you know, like the blood work is, you know, for a physician. It, it really uh, helps us to understand the tax impact of your income, your deductions, and also help us uncover any opportunities there might be to help you save in taxes. Now, the idea of tax planning is trying to utilize different ways to reduce the total taxes you pay over your lifetime. So, you know, is it about paying that the taxes now or paying it later? But again, how can we reduce the total impacts over your lifetime? So after we review the return, we actually go over it with our clients because so many times we find that our clients have no idea what's in their return. And then we can start identifying gaps uh, or we can offer advice on tax planning tips. And, you know, sometimes this might be about things they're already doing, but, you know, there's just a smarter way for them to do it in a more tax conscientious way. And we don't offer tax advice, um, but we do work along with our clients, accountants and CPAs so that we can, again, open the discussion for planning that, again, could hopefully, you know, help save them in taxes over time. Yeah, that's right. Um, we have a very specific question. This one concerns is asking which is better, leasing a car or buying a car? And uh, we're a little divided on this, I understand. So Fatima, what, first to you, what's your opinion on this? So I think it depends on what a car means to you and how you use your car. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that except for very special circumstances, a car is usually not an investment that depreciates as soon as you drive it off the lot. Um, so if you plan to keep your car for a long time, typically it's going to cost you less overall to buy your car upfront. But of course, you know, you also have to be careful to avoid any interest bearing loans. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, Reem, you have a slightly different take on this. What do you believe? Yeah, yeah I, I do agree with Fatima. It depends, like not one size fits all. Actually, it depends on your circumstances and what you're trying to achieve, going back to our goals and what we want um, in general. So when deciding between leasing or uh, financing a car or buying a car so things like uh, one thing like you need to think about it so if you are looking to allow yourself to drive a new car every few years so leasing probably is a good option for you um if you are a business owner for example um you can uh, and use the car for your business so you can deduct the the lease payment based on your use of that car and on the other hand, if you are um, going to buy the car or finance the car, um, in that way, you, you don't have any restriction on the mileage, for example. But with the lease, you have a restriction on how many miles like you can drive it. And um, 
the car will be yours after the monthly payment or if you pay upfront on that one. Actually, the tax deduction with the business owner in this case, if you buy your car or you finance it, it's going to be like less than the lease. You can deduct related expenses, but it's actually hard to track all these um, things. So um, the deduction might not be that much. And um, so the, the things to consider is that the business use of that car, the cash flow, so sometimes the payment for the lease is lower than the finance. So that's one thing also to consider. And the mileage, of course, like if you have a high annual mileage, you may pay, like you may favor the financing or the buying the car. Absolutely. It goes to prove, just like you said, there isn't a one size fits all. All right. So it looks like we have time for one last question. Uh, this one comes from a young doctor. She's just finished her residency. And she is maximizing her 401k salary deferral contribution. She's wondering how much of her paycheck should she put away or how much in addition uh, she should put away towards saving. I know that planners, you guys tend to shy away from general rules of thumb. But Reem, uh, what advice can you give to someone who's starting out in her career? Yeah, so... It's actually great to hear that he is already contributing to her retirement saving. And saving is very important, but in terms of saving rates, it depends from one person to another about their income, their expenses. So a lot of factors play on the, uh, in deciding how much to save. But uh, generally, like you want to put a percentage for um, where it should go for necessities, for example, for rent or groceries, something like that. And percentage, you can allocate it to the uh, discretionary spending, such as like entertainment or dining. And part of your income also should go towards saving and investing. So in terms of advice for somebody like starting new, so try to put for yourself a budget, like how much to put in each category. And also um, have an emergency fund that will cover like probably three to six months worth of uh, living expenses. So that will provide kind of safety net in case of unexpected expenses or job changes. Um, also um, the health saving account that we mentioned in the presentation so if she has a high deductible health plan, contributing to the SSA can provide tax advantage and help to pay for the future medical expenses. Um, yeah. Very good. How about you, Fatma? Um, what advice would you give this young uh, female physician? So, so I would echo what Rima said. You know, it's really important to understand your expenses, how much your extra cash flow is as well. You know, how much is just sitting in the bank uh, each month. And just to set up recurring investments for money that you know you're not going to need in the short term. Um, put those into your retirement accounts or even taxable investment accounts. You know, the most important variable and impactful variable in successful investing is not how much money necessarily that you put in but the time that it's invested and your consistency. So, you know, just to take a quick example to drive home the point, if we have two people who invest, one of them starts investing $100 a month at age 30, right? Maybe that's right after finishing residency. Um, the other one says, you know what, I have a lot going on. I'm going to, you know, get make more money. And they wait, you know, to invest a lump sum of 36000 at age 50 or 20 years later. In both cases, they're both going to invest $36,000 by the age of 60, but with a 7% rate of return, the investor who invested $100 a month starting at age 30 is going to actually have more than double than the one who invested a lump sum of $36,000 at age 50. So again, think of regular investing as a gift to your, you know, to your future self, and uh, believe me, you know, you're going to thank yourself one day. No, that is very powerful. Compounding is a very powerful thing. That's all very good advice. And uh, with that, we will conclude today's presentation. A short survey will pop up on your screens and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. And I wanna thank our speakers today, as well as all of you who took the time to be here uh, live with us today. And uh, if we didn't get to your question or you'd like more information, 
please do reach out to us at hello at azadasset.com and be sure to follow us on YouTube and Facebook using the handle at Azad Funds. You can also find us on LinkedIn under our full name, Azad Asset Management. Thank you again and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.